Okay, thank you everyone for being back after the very, very interesting uh, morning sessions where we've raised a good number of questions already uh, related to thinking about European issues from which I read perspectives. Now we, we're going to go to a new topic that we haven't really touched yet and we haven't touched that in our previous meetings, which is because it's for politicians, for political think tanks, is a less covered topic. But actually, we believe that it must be a part of this um, in-depth understanding uh, of populism, authoritarianism, and uh, nationalism. And we will start to discuss uh, economic nationalism. And this panel is going to start to to this discussion. Well, economic nationalism is not a new phenomenon. It has always existed uh, since, uh, since trade exists. And there's, there's a good number of uh, debate and discussions and theory and counter theory about uh, protectionism and free trade. So this has a long story. Uh, the reason why we put it on our agenda is because it, there is a revival of economic nationalism in these days, worldwide, and also within the European Union, which is, seems to be at first uh, very bizarre, because oh, this is a single market, economic, economic cooperation is the most <coughs> profound format of the European cooperation, and one of the most successful, but somehow, uh, for various reasons, economic nationalism is reviving and uh, it's very prevalent, especially also in this region. Um, just to quote the Hungarian Prime Minister, we can have a lot of good thoughts for him when we try to characterize and understand the world where we live, who already in 2011 uh, put on his political agenda publicly that. Uh, uh, a sovereign country needs a national needs national entrepreneurs. So he calls his oligarchs as national entrepreneurs uh, because this is he regards as a way to regain more strength to the nation state. And since then, in Hungary, specifically, uh, national economics, <coughs> economic nationalism is a serious theory. Uh, banks are built on in Hungarian hands, uh, and, and a lot of things are in various strange ways are uh, got back to state ownership. So there is a centralizing uh, process in terms of uh, property, and also there is an oligarchic building structure, which is really strange, and many things is supported on European funds. So the European Union, uh, which is a, a on European cooperation and for free trade and uh, liberal democracy and market economy is actually supporting something very different uh, in Hungary and obviously in other countries. So we, in our panel, will discuss the, this phenomenon, whether this is real, whether this is just a political narrative, uh, this strong nation state, which is under development in this country, is it a real intention? Is it serious? Is it possible within the EU context? Does it, as we discussed in the morning, part of a more general global trend? Or is it something specific? So this is what this wonderful panel is about. I'd like to welcome our speakers. This, we had a women panel before, now we have a men panel. Um, and I'd like to welcome Valerius uh, Valadi, who is a Hungarian uh, economist, uh, representing the Budapest Institute, a wonderful think tank. Uh, we have uh, Bartek Novak uh, from um, Poland, who is a kind of um, bipolar person, part of the political processes uh, behind Novo as a brain. He's not a politician, but he's closer to politics. And and uh, he's also a researcher himself and a 
and uh, economist. Uh, we have uh, uh, Andrzej Podolski, who is a politician. Uh, you, well, you were and will be a politician. <laughs> you will be quite a bit of politician, and, and uh, we also know uh, each other at, at, from this position, uh, also from, from Poland. Uh, and also you are very uh, present uh, in the European Democratic Party, which gives you uh, more uh, international insight. And of course, uh, we have Miroslav Bedlovi from Slovakia, very welcome, who is a member of parliament, and also a researcher, an economist. So we have a very strong group of uh, people here, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your presentation. And I will ask Bartek first to, to speak. Uh, and uh, and start and then I understand though we have uh, I offered you a couple of questions you will be free to, to speak which aspect of this very difficult and broad question will uh, touch. Well thank you, please start Thank you. <coughs> now let me just very shortly explain that I already crossed the river uh, and I'm uh, I'm, I'm take, taking the responsibility for foreign policy of Nowoczesna uh, and uh, I'm already a politician as well. <laughs> so, um, well, actually the stakes is very high. So uh, it was my uh, very much conscious, conscious choice. Uh, and I really enjoyed this. Uh, and uh, really when it comes to the subject of economic nationalism and uh, 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 protectionism. Uh, it is very popular now, but we must also ask to, to what extent it is real, to what extent it is representative in Europe, and to what extent the changing patterns of economics and society enforce us to change our way how we see economy and, and uh, in the situation in Europe. And I would uh, distinguish, in, in case of Europe, I think I would distinguish two dimensions. Dimension number one is internal, and dimension number two is external. So when it comes to internal dimensions, and when I look across the so-called so populist movement, uh, uh, very few of them actually argue against the single market. Uh, uh, not uh, uh, the UK Brexiters, because for, for them, for the UK, the single market is fundamental. Uh, although some, some issues are obviously related to the single market, like the issue of free movement of people. Uh, uh, however, single market as an idea uh, uh, is, is very much appreciated in Great Britain. Uh, in France, Marine Le Pen also has involved very much the issue of single market. She was against Euro. Uh, and many populists are against Euro, but not only populists. We've got very serious economists who are against Euro, I'm personally very much in favor. Uh, uh, but this is also another story, how you perceive the, the common currency, and is this something that, uh, that should be the connection between currency and the single market is, you may ask the questions. Uh, in case of Poland, Pol Polish Law and Justice Party is very much about advancing the single market. Uh, uh, and now, what is uh, happening in Europe in uh, general? Obviously, we are all impressed by what Donald Trump is doing, but this is, uh, uh, this is another story. Uh, but what is happening in the European Commission and in general on the level of European elites. I think, and I'm quite optimistic in that sense, that we, that we took the lessons uh, of the mistakes we as a political elites actually did in the past. Uh, and we must be very aware, I must say, when I came to Indonesia and Asia in general, and it was some years ago during the economic crisis in Europe and in the US, and I was researching the world order and how do they see the world order. And they told me something that was very shocking. What are you talking about? You produce the economic crisis in the US and Europe, and your economists suffer the most. These were not Asian economies which were hit by the economic crisis, and these were not Asian models. 
Uh, uh, so I think that in some sense, in the post-crisis Europe, because we see that tendencies to recovery, uh, uh, it is on the, the reflection of what, the, what went wrong with economics uh, is on the right track. I, didn't, I don't think that we found the right responses. However, we don't have much economic nationalism today in Europe uh, because it would, it would have to touch the single market. Uh, however, what are the tendencies? I would call it a social term. And, uh, uh, and the priority of Juncker Commission is about more social dimension in policy. Uh, there are some problems because, for example, in case of posting directive uh, that is about the uh, 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 transport sector, it may really have competitive advantage of Polish transport sector. Uh, because we are relying on the fact that we are much cheaper than in the West. So I think this kind of issues will be a defining issue for the single market in terms of uh, in terms of that each country looks at its own workers and what, what is the threat for them and how to protect them. Uh, but it's not, it's not bad per se, okay? I think that we must take into account those group of people who are somehow, uh, to, to whom we didn't put attention. Attention is one of, one of the issues that both in the United States and in Europe, uh, some groups of people uh, want to have attention in the debate, in the arguments. This is something that liberals somehow omitted in, in the past, I must, I must admit. And the second uh, uh, dimension is the global dimension. And from European point of view, uh, it is the point in which I really afraid uh, economic protectionism and national nationalism, uh, and we must put the question mark. And I was one of the persons and, and my own party uh, who, who was defending CETA, the EU-Canada trade agreement. And the debate was extremely populistic and very, very hard to defend. Uh, uh, but what is this about? It is all about free trade. And what's people's attitude? Uh, never mind the, the concrete arguments, uh, and we all base on the, on the blueprints on that what trade is beneficial in general to all. But people do not believe in it. And some groups of society do not believe in it. And this was the case of CETA. And this is also the case of uh, uh, TTIP. So suddenly what has happened, the legitimacy of the European Commission has been questioned, and now the European Commission must go for the approval to national parliaments in order to have a trade deal implemented. And this is on one side very dangerous, because uh, we may have simply no deals in the future. If it goes normal ratification way, it will be lost uh, uh, in, in some parliaments. Uh, on the other side, it is also a sign that uh, democratic societies can uh, codicide and can contribute to the debate. However, you may ask the question, uh, what kind of debate do we have? And this is entirely not based on facts, and this is a trouble. But I think that when it comes to multilateral global agreements and the agreements of the EU, we are, uh, we are already on the losing side. We cannot expect any further liberalization on the side of WTO. Uh, it will be very difficult for the EU to sign another agreement. Even the agreement, association agreement and DCFTA, even comprehensive trade agreement with Ukraine, uh, stops in Netherlands Parliament because people organize the referendum. And I'm sure people will be organizing the referendum against this kind of issues. Uh, uh, so this is a big uh, question mark when it comes to uh, the future of protectionism and, and the future of so-called economic nationalism. But 
Uh, we must also admit that there is something in it, that economists have to ask what are the results of current policies. And okay, if you look at, at the global trading system, well, one of the biggest shocks which, which we are now discovering is the entrance of China into the WTO. Because I would say that China has changed WTO much more than we thought. It was not the WTO that changed so much China in terms of pursuing economic trade policy. Uh, and now the argument of Donald Trump was precisely against China. Chinese uh, workers suffered a lot, uh, US workers suffered a lot because of Chinese competition. And we do have as well in Europe. And now we've got under negotiation um, uh, EU-China agreement. And it will really raise attention very soon, I'm sure of it. So these are the questions, and it's, it's a kind of a paradox today, but very visible, that when it comes to measuring attitudes towards globalization, all Asia is very positive. Europe and the US are negative. These are pure research center, I think, so months ago. Uh, and today in Davos, Xi Jinping was defending uh, open trade laws and globalization process. Uh, uh, so I think in that dimension, uh, Europe will be much more selective. Uh, and uh, I expect some kind of trouble. And there is another dimension where I expect trouble, and it is advancement of the single market. Because, uh, let me say it openly, uh, most of the single market is not liberalized. And, and uh, we would expect a lot of benefits from liberalization of services, for example. But it will be very hard to, to uh, make another step forward. I don't expect that we, we, we will do step back, although there are some bad signs, like for example there is a Decrease, quite visible decrease of implementation of the single market rules on national level. Uh, uh, it is a decay of the single market, if I may say so. So these are the threats, but uh, 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 they are rather of very different yet to describe nature. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It uh, was very interesting to to start with this, this the, the global phenomena, and you described the, the anti-globalist movement, which is very present in Europe, in right wing and left wing. It's formulating itself in political places. You probably know more about the the, the right wing place, but it's, it's up to the countries. And of course, that protection is uh, in danger uh, in these days. And, and we have to watch carefully because that can be uh, something very different from the world we're in now. So, Balaj, I give the floor to you now. Oh, maybe you can fire. Okay, maybe you can to this side. Can I just speak to them? No, don't, don't rearrange. I will not. Okay, so thank you. Okay, so thank you for having me. I'm an economist, I work for a think tank called the Budapest Institute, and I was about to bore you with a, with a presentation about the relationship between cohesion funds and, uh, and corruption, and I will speak about that, but I will not go through the slides. I decided that that would just to drop you of another 10 minutes, and I will make a, sh a short argument. I still include the the top slide there, because this is a way to save faces for our gender, because even though all four of us are men, at least my co-authors are women, two of them. Uh, uh, and so some women participate here too, uh, in a certain way. And also because I wanted to go, if I succeed, but I won't. I think you have to be close to me. Yeah, okay. Then I just step all the way to one one slide that I would want to be there because I like it a lot. This is uh, this is something very Central Eastern European. 
it's hard to make out. This is a strange shaped quasi bridge for bicycles over the small brook Zodima in uh, something like 60 kilometers from Budapest. And the uh, brook, you can see, it goes this here, so the, the, the bit of this that can be of set of some use is like 20 meters over there, but then there is this other part, and the, the function is something like a bicycle training path, but it's mostly closed for cyclists, so it's not clear what is there. It was financed with EU funds. I'm pretty sure that you will have examples like this from uh, all of our happy countries that have uh, been the beneficiaries of, uh, of uh, pretty generous uh, European structural funds. Um, so what I want to speak a little bit about is what is the relationship between this and, uh, and uh, economic nationalism or certain economic policies and policies in general in those uh, Eastern Europe, Central Eastern European member states that are the beneficiaries of this fund. Uh, and I was also nudged to show you the bright future and which way we can change and what we can do. I, not sure I will be able to do that, but at least I point in a certain direction, uh, and maybe that helps a bit. So, uh, the argument is the following. First, let's not for a second forget that the European Union is not a federal arrangement, right? Not in terms of its legal, you know, what, what the European Commission or Euro European Parliament can or cannot do, cannot do a lot of things. And there are other things that it has to get the agreement of the council to, which represents the powerful member states' governments. And also in terms of economic uh, might, right? The, the, the joint European budget is something like 1% of the summed up GDP of the member states, right? That's very little, right? So what we are looking at is a system of transfers set every seven years that moves something like a third of this very small uh, joint budget from the European Union as such, but basically it comes from the richer uh, member states to uh, the poorer member states. So this is not a lot of money for Germany or Denmark or, uh, or uh, the Netherlands. But it is a lot of money for the beneficiary countries, right? I'm not going into the institutional details, which are pretty complicated and change every cycle. But uh, what we should think of is sums that make up something like two to three percent of the GDP of uh, of Poland or Hungary or Slovakia year by year, right? This is a lot, <coughs> right? So it is a something like four or five percent if half of the GDP is the budget, the national budget. This is a lot of money that is being transferred from this weak, higher up federal level in a sort of intra-governmental transfer fashion to the member states. Right. Now, the paper that you should actually read, download from the Budapest Institute web page and read because it's a nice one and it's very accessible because it was written for the a green uh, party group of the European Parliament, so not for other economists, but for politicians and lay people. Um, in, in it, we summarize the, the academic, the scholarly literature about this transfer. Right? And uh, my biased and oversimplified version of uh, certain strands of the scholarly literature will just contain the following. This is a, it, formally it represents European solidarity, right? European values at their best, right? The rich voluntarily helping the poor, right? But cynical political scientists suggest this is a way to buy the allegiance of the elites of these member states for the European project. Right? Let I make a break here to let this cynical claim to sink in into the minds of the more naive in the audience, right? But well, maybe there is nobody like that here, right? So this is, this is to make sure that the Poles and the Hungarians and the Romanians, the powerful people, the people who actually decide what's going on there, will safely want to stay within the EU even if there are proposals or changes or, or, or statements made that are not to their liking. 
right? Because a lot of money is thrown at them, not at their country, but actually is given them, right? So to a large extent, this not exclusively, but to a large extent, this money is transferred to those governments for them to spend. Yes, there is a lot of planning. Yes, there is some give and take between the European Commission bureaucrats and those countries. Yes, there are yearly reports, you know, saying, no, no, maybe it shouldn't be spent exactly like that. Yes, there are Olaf reports four, five, six years after things have been finished saying maybe this was not right, right? Uh, there, yes, there is, uh, you know, reports published by, by, by the DG Radio that, uh, that uh, on their front page say everything is fine and then on page 677 actually explain that things are not that fine. This is all going on, uh, but on the whole this is money given from the common budget to the uh, political elites of these countries for them to stay loyal. Uh, now this money is a godsend to these governments because when they want to do things, those could be different things, right? They could be maximizing social welfare and in a far-sighted way reform you know, state uh, institutions or, uh, or helping the poorest bits of their own country or any sort of goals. There are limits to what this can be spent on, but you can always uh, rearrange money, right? You can always spend this on something that you would have financed uh, uh, with proper domestic tax uh, raised money and, uh, and then take that money and spend on what you want it to. So there is a huge room to rearrange it, you know, spend it on whatever you want to. So these countries can spend this extra money and since this money has not been raised by way of taxing your own taxpayers, right, who happen to be your voters as well, there is a lot of room of, uh, of uh, spending it in all sorts of, uh, of sinister ways, right? Uh, catering to, uh, to, uh, to medium voter preferences, uh, uh, channeling money to your own political party or to oligarchs, uh, um, using it for corruption. There is a quite some literature about it. Wonderful Hungarian Research Institute Corruption Research Center, Budapest, looked at procurement spending and uh, how, and used fancy ways to figure out how corrupt they are. And they found that in Hungary, the EU funds, when the procurement is uh, financed with EU funds, then there is a bigger, bigger uh, occurrence of, of there, is, there is more corruption going on than when the same state, using the same domestic procurement mechanism, spends Hungarian taxpayers' money. So there is a, this is a godsend for all sorts of political uh, purposes in, in these countries. Uh, If you are, if your politics is anti-Brussels, right, then that gives an extra twist, right? You're spending their money on all sorts of national projects that are, you know, suggesting that they go to hell, right? This is a wonderful arrangement. Um, now, this system is not necessarily good for the beneficiary countries. Right? This is a question, and it's hard to measure, right? There are all sorts of methodological problems to figure out. Uh, how good it is for a country to receive a big pile of transfers from outside, right? This has been raised a long time before the EU, looking at international aid, whatever. Again, this is a huge literature, and I'll just summarize what I think are the most, uh, most robust findings, which is that the, the social uh, welfare effect of uh, transfers from, from monetary transfers to a government from abroad are conditional on the institutional arrangement, the quality of the institutions and the political system of the beneficiary countries. If it's a decent country with decent institutions, then it's good for it to receive extra money. If it's a nightmare, if it's a dictatorship, if uh, uh, the bureaucrats are self-serving, then getting extra money need not be a good deal for the country at all. Actually, it might harm the country. Again, so there is no guarantee that it helps that we get the money. Now, this is the descriptive part, and then comes the question of what sort of remedies or how this could or should be changed, or at least how, uh, what our country
countries should fight for in the upcoming next cycle of uh, budgetary uh, force trading. We know that another seven year cycle will come up soon and, and negotiations about that will start, have already started, but will start and we, the first non papers are coming out, plans are being drawn. And here I think uh, we have to curb our enthusiasm for incremental, mostly cosmetic solutions. Right? The, I can, I'm not necessarily a fan of all of the European, European Com Commission bureaucracy, but those are bright people. So you actually go into the archives and read of how you could introduce a little more conditionality and transparency and evaluation in this whole process. Those solutions have almost all have been already thought of and have been written down, and you can find them in reports. We did, I know because we did, and we have found. We, we, we thought of <laughs> clever solutions, and then we found it in the Barber report about seven years ago. So yes, you can try and improve the system a little bit, but since the underlying raison d'etre of the whole thing is a strong political economy arrangement that is a part of the whole deal that makes the European Union run. If we think that this should be changed, uh, and our goal is not just getting a little bit more, or more realistically not getting too much less than we did seven years ago, then we have to come up with some sort of a new political economy arrangement, right? changing the system. Now, of course, there are bits of that you might want to change this whole cohesion uh, fund system where you might have to change the treaties, which is not easy, right? But there are other things that could be done that change, that, that require changing the deal, but don't necessarily re require a referendum in every country and the big you know, legal rearrangement of what the, the Euro European uh, uh, Union is. Just one example, uh, two examples. One is very simple. You could just abolish this. I mean, you could just say, let's not run this whole system. I mean, I'm not arguing that this would be necessarily a good thing. It would pro probably not be a good thing for Estonia. It might be a good thing for Hungary on the whole. Uh, again, depending on how bad the political institutions are, because that's what the, the social effect of these transfers uh, uh, is, uh, is dependent on in the beneficiary countries, but uh, you might, we might ask for something in return, right? some other thing that is important for the region. Another arrangement, this is what we make an argument for in this paper towards the very end, is to change at least some of this budget into a Europe-wide system of, uh, of uh, social transfers and basically spend it on the poor. And this is one more slide I might want to use from this, and I almost done from this slideshow. Yeah. This is uh, the proportion of the severely materially deprived, and don't bore you with the technical details of what that means, or very poor in a, in a sort of objective sense, uh, in different EU member countries, right? And the green uh, columns are the cohesion countries, and the blue ones are the not primarily cohesion countries. Right? So this suggests that if you have, if you do something like the food stamp program in the United States, right? That's something very central that is actually a kind of conditional minimum income scheme or something like that. I'm not going into details, and it's hard to figure out the details, right? And you just say, I define what is really, really very poor in Europe, and I transfer this money to those people, and I bypass the, the national government. Then you could put a system together so that the beneficiaries would happen to be the same countries, right? To a large extent, the money would flow into those countries, because that's where the poor people happen to be, because that's, that's one way of uh, that's one interpretation of there being poor, the poor member states. Right? Of course, this requires a lot of institutions and whatever, but this could be a, a, a deal. Right? I'm still helping the poor, but not in terms of giving the Orban government a big pile of money to spend on posters against me, against Europe, but rather, you know, the money going to, to the villages and the poor Hungarians. So there is a room for using this. Uh, 
uh, negotiation round to actually rethink our role and what we are doing and changing the cohesion funds in a non-incremental way. But for that, we ourselves in the Visegrad countries, Eastern Europe, the beneficiary countries, will have to take an active role and define what we want by more than just you know, we want still a big pile of money because we're poor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. This was really a very provocative uh, and interesting um, presentation, and uh, you gave a lot of room for for comments from our panelists and also from, from the public. And of course, I'm looking forward to hearing the Miroslav. Uh, you are from Slovakia. You are in the eurozone. You are the happy Visegrad. Uh, so, what do you think uh, of? Um, uh, the EU funds, if you can make a comment, of course you'll be free to, to present what you say, but I would really like to hear your opinion of those uh, uh, trade relations and threats and also the EU funds as a kind of moral hazard. I understood that well. Sure. Well, so honestly... Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. If it will work. Okay, if it will work. Oh, yeah. So, uh, well, honestly, I do not think that the EU funds are that important uh, in understanding economic nationalism. Uh, I think they're quite important as a source of public investment in this region. Uh, and they're also quite important as a, uh, well, it's difficult to say because I'm tempted to say a source of corruption in this region or the source of corruption in this region. But that's of course not true in the sense that if governments had the same amount of money available for public investment from domestic sources, there would be even more corruption than there is with the EU funds. So it's not the EU funds that are the source of the corruption, it's that you know this is the first time since the beginning of the transition that in the last 10 years, national governments have huge piles of money available for public investment. Uh, and, you know, and, and understandably given the, the still weak governance structures and also other problems, there's a, there's a huge amount of corruption associated with it. Uh, but uh, honestly, I don't consider that to be the main show. So uh, let me, in the limited time that I have, turn to, to the issue that I think is interesting to debate, and that is uh, whether we are seeing a resurgence of economic nationalism and what can be done about it in the region. Uh, my two previous colleagues have mostly looked at it from the Europe-wide and uh, global point of view. So let me be a bit more parochial and look at it from the local point of view. By local, I mean Central European point of view. Uh, I will make uh, five points about the sources of economic nationalism in this region, and I'll make a short step and potential remedies, um, two or three. The first thing to remember is that economic nationalism is to some extent a very natural state of affairs. Uh, it's not true for Hungary or Slovakia, it's true for Belgium and UK and the US and any other country. Uh, for reasons that we could explore if I had more time, people generally seem to prefer domestic ownership of means of production. Uh, you know, all things being, all other things being equal. So, uh, and actually, the Central European region, except for Poland, is probably the most globally open region in the world, if you measure it not just by the size of the trade, but also by size of the foreign ownership of the key means of production. I don't know of any other region in the world where there is an average of 90% foreign ownership of the banking and finance. Since banking is the financial system in this region, that means there is a foreign ownership of the, of the financial system as a whole where there is a very high level of foreign ownership of not just manufacturing but also of, of the service uh, sector and where of course there is a huge trade uh, you know, uh, where which on average is reaches somewhere between 79 percent of GDP either exports or, or imports. Spawn has the numbers a little bit lower given its size uh, but uh, but I think the story is similar. You would have to go all the way to Singapore and Ireland to find something similar and even there it would not be equal. 
So uh, the first thing is that, the first remark is that if you are experiencing a bit of economic nationalism in Central Europe, it's not that surprising. And actually our pendulum is so much, so way to, to the global end that uh, one could even argue it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, so, so surprising. The second thing is that economic nationalism, of course, uh, is usually, not always, but usually counterproductive for the domestic economy uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but people have to experience that. I myself remember in the mid-90s when the privatization was the name of the game still, uh, people in Slovakia had a genuine choice in election between parties that told them it's best to sell the companies to reputable foreign investors and the party which said, which said we need to sell it to our own people to create our domestic capitalist class. The second group won decisively. It took five years and a lot of bankruptcies and a lot of uh, pillaging for people to realize that actually it was not a better choice. But it was only this learning by experience that helped. There is no amount of communication or anything that could have persuaded Slovaks at the time that, that uh, IBM is better than our own people, so to say. Uh, and I think we are now, and this leads to the first point, which is that given that our economies are now so globalized in terms of not just uh, exports and trade, but also in terms of ownership, uh, it's not that surprising that uh, that many people listen, you know, to one of, that many people consider more domestication as a means of solving some of the problems we are seeing. So, you know, because that's not what we have. We don't have very strong domestically on the nationalist economies. Uh, and, you know, my, the first speaker said that given the single market rules, there is not much space for economic nationalism. Uh, and I would say that's certainly true. I mean, if you compare it to Venezuela or, you know, countries where you can truly see the, the, the madness. Uh, so in our region, and so far, it tends to manifest itself either in chronic capitalism in the service sector, it tends to manifest itself in more funny things like the current initiative for uniform food standards, uh, you know, that, uh, I mean, it's not that it's not a serious thing that uh, Nutella is selling a different Nutella in Slovakia than in Austria, but to have a Prime Minister summit about it seems a little bit too much to me, which, as you know, we, we had that the last Michigan summit was dealing with this Nutella uh, problem. So, but in a way, I think the reason why these small things is because it's difficult to be nationalist on the big things for the reasons that already mentioned, but I would not give up on the leaders' ingenuity, especially if they came to feel that they can disregard the European norms more and more. So, that's the, that's the second point. The third point I would make is also that there is actually a lot of legitimacy to these complaints, uh, and for the following reason. Uh, Slovakia and Hungary, to lesser extent Poland and Czech Republic, but Slovakia and Hungary in particular have what we call dual economies. We have extremely productive, extremely uh, well invested, uh, uh, largely multinational factories and other parts of the economy, uh, which are basically driving the economic development of these two to four countries, as I said, less for Poland and Czech Republic, more for Slovakia and Hungary. And then there are large parts of the economy, domestic, small economy, which have very different productivity picture, very different uh, future ahead of them. And uh, it's this dualism, which has been in, in place, I think, for at least 10 to 15 years, if not more, that's now, uh, it's becoming clear that it will not disappear on its own, that the market will not just solve it in the way that we just have to wait. So, so it's a legitimate issue. Should governments be doing something more to encourage the dual economy to, to converge? So I think there's some legitimacy. Uh, even though I think some, you know, the, the most popular and significant nationalist policies are the ones that help the least on this. So, so, so why don't we agree on the means? The, the last point I would, uh, I would actually, uh, so the last two quick points I would make is one is that given that the foreign ownership of the economy is primarily concentrated on multinationals, this also means that the usual struggle of the small guys versus the big guys tend to become nationalists in our countries because the big guys are the foreigners and the small guys are the domestics. Even if, of course, it doesn't have to be that way. For example, we recently had a fight in Slovakia about whether we should have a constitutional amendment to protect domestic ownership of soil. I'm sure something uh, you can uh, easily understand. And I was against it, and I was explaining, I don't care if it's domestic or foreign, I, I, I just want it to be farmers and people who, who use the soil well. I don't care whether the farm is Dutchman or Austrian or Slovak, but I wouldn't give the soil to the Slovak oligarchs or to the Chinese oligarchs. And that was my point of view, but it was a minority point. The majority point of view was still suing, dividing this by domestic versus foreign. 
Also because the foreign was usually associated with the big guys, of which people are afraid that they will scoop up the land, they will destroy it by unsustainable policies, etc., etc., etc. So that, that's the next to last point. And the last point is that uh, ever since the beginning of the crisis, we have seen a large diminishment of the legitimacy of what I would call the Brussels consensus. And that has come through two paths. One is the decrease in the growth of this region. I mean, we are now back to growth, which is at the, you know, we are now still the leaders of Europe in growth. If you look at the top five, six countries growing in the EU at the moment, uh, I think Slovakia, Hungary, Czech Republic, and Poland are usually among the top five, six, seven. I mean, also with Romania and a few others, Spain. Uh, so we are still doing well in terms of catch up, but in terms of the absolute rates, you know, it's 3%. Slovakia is between 6 and 10 at the top of its convergence game. And even though this is now producing uh, employment gains, it's not producing huge income gains, or at least not the ones that people would like to see. Uh, so, together with the permanent euro crisis, this creates a lot of legitimacy crisis for the Brussels consensus and, of course, opens up this game that maybe we can have a better, uh, better national game. So, these are the sources. I mean, there were more, but these are the ones that I can think of. Now, what about the remedies? Now, there could be uh, two hours of remedies, but let me uh, let me just go to three points. Uh, one is uh, fighting monopolies and fighting for for changing competition. Uh, I will give you my own story. Uh, not this is most important, but it's personal. Over the last six years, I have led in Slovakia a fight for more competition in the mortgage market. Uh, we have we have a very concentrated banking market. And among that, we have, the fair, we have the most expensive mortgages in the Eurozone. Now we have one of the cheapest mortgages in the Eurozone. And you know, if I'm telling you that you have to believe me, you can check the Slovak websites. About two thirds to three quarters of that is down to the laws that I pass in our parliament. That make it much easier for consumers to switch mortgages between banks. And as a result, the consumers are saving around 120 million euros annually, just on this one thing. And the banks hate me. If I was in the US where they could fund the campaign, you know, my opponent, I would be losing. But since it's a lack of proportional representation, so they don't have a district where they could beat me. <laughs> I'm still in the parliament. And, uh, and it's very popular, of course, but it's also economically meaningful. And even the bank analysts now admit that the previous margins were too high. This is, this is much better. So I didn't have to be a nationalist. I didn't fight the foreign banks. I just fought for the consumer. So one way is to repackage this as, as what it is, which is a pro-competition, pro-consumer policies rather than anti-foreign and nationalist policies. Uh, the second is end of what I call regional dualism. And um, the one problem that we have, not so much in the Czech Republic, though a little bit there, but mostly in Slovakia, Hungary, and Poland, is huge regional differences. And uh, you know, these are mostly concentrated in the east of respective countries, and sometimes in Slovakia also in the southeast and south. Uh, and the thing is that these are now contributing to the rise of these economic nationalism because many people in these regions feel that uh, they have been left behind, but also that the people in the capital and in the Brussels don't care. So it's not just that you're trying to help us, but you're failing, but it's you don't care actually about us. You, you know, your recipe is for us to go to work to Austria or to, you know, go to work to Western Slovakia or just be on the dole or, or, you know, or, or do something else of this kind. So, and uh, I think unless we can seriously demonstrate to these regions, people in many, if enough people in these regions that the governments are serious about the internal convergence, then I think uh, economic nationalism, uh, paradoxically not regionalism, but nationalism, will be one of the outcomes because these people are then more likely to believe that the new nationalist leaders will come to Bratislava, keep the old guys out, and fight the Brussels guy and the foreigners and the multinationals and all the guys who are, who are destroying their local economies in their views. So, so I think you have to offer a serious positive uh, alternative, which doesn't necessarily have to mean so much for money, though it sometimes do. I'll give you one example from Slovakia. I know it's a little bit of Hungary. I think Hungary is better in this regard. Recently, we had a paper published where uh, two researchers show that the EU agriculture subsidies that we have, Slovakia is using in a way which favors uh, low employment, uh, low employment and high capital intensity production. So that basically means that the given amount of EU money that comes to Slovakia for agriculture is largely spent by large companies on large plots of land, not employing many people. 
so they calculated if we actually switch the rules of the game a little bit within the EU confines, just within what you're allowed, you could create a much more employment intensive uh, agriculture subsidy system in the underdeveloped regions and you could create probably a few tens of thousands of jobs without actually spending additional money. Of course, you would again run up against the very strong interests which are interested in receiving, you know, which today get very nice money for not doing very much except for, for, for putting up some, some of the money, the capital. Uh, but if you're willing to do that, we could have this. So, but this would show that actually governments and politicians are serious about helping these regions, building employment in these regions, even when it's fighting very powerful vested interests around their parties and around the domestic economy. And the third uh, potential remedy, and the most complicated one, is uh, most difficult, is trying to help the domestication of the innovative part of the economy. Uh, because at the moment, uh, un or until recently, the most innovation and the most import of knowledge and creation of knowledge is like happens through import. So, so you, you import uh, the investors and they import the know-how, whether it's scientific know-how, manager know-how, product know-how, etc. What we need now is, is to domesticate that to a larger extent. Uh, for example, and there are many things you can do. You can help the startup economy for young people. You can help with availability of finance for people who have grown up in this multinational economy and have now the know-how skills and the relationships to set up their own companies, but they just don't have the money. Because if you are a middle manager in, uh, I don't know, a BMW plant or, or a Volkswagen plant, that doesn't necessarily make it easy for you to start up your own supplier, even if you have all the other things. So. Availability of finance, uh, ecosystem for startups, but that's the most difficult thing, of course, because it's most susceptible to corruption and it's most susceptible to cronyism. So I'm not advising that, you know, pouring billions. But there is something what I would call a natural speed limit. If, even if you do this well, there is a limit to how quickly this can grow, and, you know. And if you try to speed up beyond that, you'll get the cronies and corruption and waste. So uh, it's always tempting for politicians to say, oh, hey, here is a hundred million or two hundred million just to point to that to demonstrate I'm very serious about that. But actually, I think here you have to be much more careful about just pouring just a little bit of water and letting the thing grow and those speed just have, and just, you know, accelerating it just a little bit, even if that's the most difficult politically. So these are not, you know, grand solutions, perfect solutions, but they are example, I think, of solutions which can help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good, and another aspect of uh, the, the national economies, and also giving examples of why it's, it's legitimate in, in the region and in countries where we actually would like to develop. Uh, and not necessarily contribute to that to what I said, so we are just another profile. And now I would like to ask Andre um, for your comments, please. Please, this Okay. Thank you, Shana. Uh, thank you for having me here and uh, for your nice words. You, you are the one who understands very well how to is to be future and former politician in one person because you have a relatively long standing in those two. So I'm this very critical moment of holidays and you know how one should enjoy it to be free from many responsibilities. Um, according to the agenda of this seminar, I have one minute. I think it will be enough after such a <laughs> such an important presentation. So many things were said. Uh, I don't want to refer directly to economic pro problems because, well, I'm not the economist as a matter of the fact, and I always regard economy as a part of the political context of uh, the situation we are in. However. I appreciate the fact that many of the speakers uh, pointed out that economics is one of the factors that create the situation in, in which we are now as Europeans, uh, the situation of nationalism, but they do not underline the fact that the economy might be the only solution because it is not. The major error or mistake of the previous government in Poland which caused it after eight years of relatively successful governing period, they had to give up and to handle over the power and public party law and justice was the fact that the politicians of the former government used to think that it's enough to have economic success uh, to have people come relax easily. They what they were doing uh, it was watering the emotions down. 
Uh, they did not appreciate the fact that the economy does not necessarily fulfill a entire human being's act, uh, life, and some emotions are also necessary. Um, a level of identification is very important. Um, a fundament of his or hers place in the life uh, is not to be underappreciated. And this was a part of the success brought into um, into life by the Communist Party. The other part was, of course, that they did not understand that people much more appreciate the effects of economic success in their own pockets rather than on the streets. That is much more important to have money to bring uh, the kids for the holidays for the first time abroad than to enjoy new waterways, which are uh, simply everybody's uh, property. And this is number two. The bubbles are very, very successful uh, in addressing to individual people ambitions, needs, and aspirations. Of course, if you look at the statistics and you see what was the average standard of living 25 years ago uh, in, I think, in, in, in all four, uh, these four countries. And by the way, this is a seminar on Visegrad group. I'm the first person here to use the word Visegrad. This is uh, sorry, I'm second on that. I'm the first one to to say that, uh, which tells much more about Visegrad than any 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 analysis. But I will come to Visegrad later. Uh, so this 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 is the second part, and this is why it's so easy to appeal uh, to people, showing that they must care about their own interests, not the interests of the entire society of Europe. Not to the abstract. Do not go to the abstract, go to the concrete. The concrete is what people really feel. Then it is very easy uh, to follow uh, this with the messages on um, migrants, refugees, taking your jobs away from you, international capital, buying new factories, new precious factories for a uh, for a cent, and so on. This is a very important factor of uh, this anti-rational revolution, a revolution we are taking part in. Uh, in regard to nationalism, economic nationalism and protectionism, I wouldn't condemn automatically those notions. <coughs> there are some levels of protectionism that are highly acceptable, while the conditions are not. A couple of years I was living the same on globalism. And uh, I pointed out that we cannot simply say that world free market will be something which we expect, while the major players on this scene do not respect the same rules. I mean, for example, China. You cannot say about fair and free trade with the country, which voluntarily defines the value of the currency. This is not a free game, there is not a fair game. You cannot uh, speak about fair trade of uh, the means of the energy while you yourself are investing a lot of billions of dollars into, for example, miners' safety. And in the same time, you pull the coal from China or Ukraine, where those money are not being spent, so the coal is cheaper. But the difference in this price is a human life. It's, it's thousands of human lives sacrifice in the Ukrainian or Chinese colonies. You don't call it free trade, right? And you call, do not call it fair trade, first of all. So if you oppose uh, opening your markets to everyone who wants to use it from a uh, point of view of common rules for everyone, it's not the unacceptable protectionism. It's a single uh, being careful of the shape of our planet and of the rules for everyone to be equal and the same. Um, European Union emerged not only around common economy, but also around common values that were shared by father founders, and we assume were shared by the countries who joined the European Union. And in this regard, we cannot forget about uh, combining those two. We cannot forget about economic cooperation within the European Union being based on the common world of values. 
And many of our countries, or the leaders, or the politicians, or the populist parties, are behaving towards the European Union like this kid towards her mother or his mother, right? You you have to eat meat, but you don't have to eat potatoes. No. If you have your meat, you have to have your potatoes too. If you want to have benefits, you have to accept the duties. And if I would condemn the European Union, it's, it's only because the European Union is not very much concentrated in squeezing out the uh, those values from the countries that are present, that we will, will let our nations to believe that we can be beneficiaries, but we do not have duties, but we do not have to share solidarity with the European nations. And this is the worst side of uh, this uh, economic nationalisms. Uh, you could hear this in the recent speech a Polish Prime Minister who, in the most cynical and unacceptable way, used the Manchester assault to attack Europe, to not show any sign of solidarity. And when this comes from the leader of the nation who 25, 30 years ago was mainly the beneficiary of European solidarity, uh, the country that was one of the very first to begin the revolution that ended not only in defeating the communism in the Central and Eastern Europe, but also in building our community to the east, including the nations that were for many, many years um, behind the uh, cotton. It's one of the most unfair things you could do. And of course, it doesn't cost money, but it costs. Uh, the vision of a common future of those nations. And this is sometimes more important because this causes, the, the world common values causes that we have the ability to cooperate, that we have the ability to have as much common understanding and trust that we can open our borders not only to our goods but also for the free um, movement of people, information, ideas, capital. Um, as far as the V4 is concerned, I will tell you a couple of remarks um, what was the past and what is the future. Of course, the original cooperation is one of the finest and very, very positive things in Europe. And we have a lot of stories of success of regional corporations on the different levels, from little communes lying uh, on two sides of one border to the countries. But since 2015, the V4 group, uh, in some politicians' minds, began to be a, a kind of a silent alternative towards the European Union. Uh, Pogo was a leader, of course, of this thinking, um, which resulted in absolute marginalization of V4 as a power inside the European Union. Why? Because the region is as much powerful as it is able to define common interests and defend it uh, with one univocally on the Forum of the European Union. If this cooperation, regional cooperation, remains the only way, only the way to oppose the migration policy and does not fulfill the European Union with own ideas, own projects, it becomes to be a problem for everyone, not the power. If you look detail by detail on different votings within the European Parliament and in front of the European Commission, you can see that countries of the V4, especially Poland and Hungary, never voted in the European Union. was it? All one always voted against Poland, <laughs> with the exception of migration. All one always voted against. We do not have common interests. We, don't, we do not trade common interests. We say, support us here, we will support you there. This is also the, um, the result of the Euroscepticism in the groups. Because if you gather and concentrate on your serve a bunch of Euroskeptics, you do not have experts, you do not have enough experts to formulate the programs to formulate the 
uh, the inquiries for the exclusion of the European Parliament. You do not have the subjects to discuss. My friends, right? Yeah, she wrote that I have all the forty five things to do. Um, I, I will always tell the stories from the European Parliament about the current people who are coming there from Poland and who do not know anyone. They do not membership. They do not have private meetings. They have only a card even handled to them by their minister. So they just uh, read a couple of rights and rights and go back to Poland. This is not how the policy system should be made. So uh, in conclusion, I would tell the only way is to continue with creating those mechanisms of trust, whoever is ruling in our countries, and to not give up against the populist policy.